Welcome to the International Teacher Podcast with your host, Greg, the single guy, and Matt, the family guy. We're recording episodes from around the globe to tell you about the best kept secret in education. That's right, it's teaching overseas. We're glad to have you. Let's do this. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, family, friends, people lost in the Banana Republics, uh, and some people who are just out traveling and were bored and needed a podcast to listen to. This is Greg and Matt coming at you. We are the International Teacher Podcast, and this is Matt. I am the family guy. You could also refer to me as expat Matt. And today I'm taking over the show. I'm going to hijack it because I get to interview my buddy Greg, the single guy. Or you may also hear me refer to him as Goyo as well. So if you hear that, you, uh, you're you in the correct podcast. Goyo, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here once again with you, Matt, online and in the ears of all of our listeners. Absolutely. Uh, so, Greg, a lot has happened in the last five, six days since we originally re- released our first couple of episodes. Um, we had some surprising things happen and people actually listened. So uh, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback so far. I know we had like, I don't know, I think we're up to 77 on on Spotify. I think there's, uh, iTunes hasn't even got us on there yet. So there's iHeartRadio and we're going to have it so they can listen to whatever podcast uh, they want to. Yeah, absolutely. And the the relative lack of hate mail we've received so far must be a testament to the job we're doing. Although (laughs) it's probably immediate family and friends who have listened to it. So there's still time for that also. Yeah, I really thought it was just going to be my mom once again, like my newsletter that I send out or my (laughs) website or, you know, mom (laughs) is the only one. I think dad jumped on there too, listened to us like three or four times and gave me the whole rundown. And she was upset too, Matt. Why, Why was she upset? Well, Mom said, you know, Greg, it's also, you were mentioning the fact that, you know, who your listeners are going to be. And I really think that it should be, you should have included families because we really care about you. And so I agree with that, right? You you mentioned that before. Yeah, absolutely. And you're not doing any service to your mom talking like that. Your mom sounds nothing like that. It's more like, Greg, why aren't you talking to families about this? This is upsetting that you're not including us. Oh, I mean, let's, you're going to get it, Matt. She's going to come after <laughs> you next. I might have to edit yeah. that whole section out. Yeah, well, add when I imitate your mother, just add a deeper voice to that. Um, you know, actually, uh, I've had some several people write online that they, that's exactly it. Their kid is in college and they're looking at exploring international teaching. And all of a sudden we started, I've gotten to start a dialogue with several people that I haven't heard from in years. So it's been kind of cool. So a nice segue to reconnect with people too. But your mom is right. We need to talk about the family perspective of it. You know, I think your mom would be a good resource too, because your mom has also lived the expat lifestyle as well. So I think she would give a very uh, interesting view of what it's like to be an expat, but also have a kid who is now an expat too. Well, I don't know if we're going to have to, I think we can maybe get some dialogue from her, but I don't know if we want to go through a whole interview you know my dad will be shouting in the back yeah you know, like it's in a submarine like tell him that i'm on there too tell him i love him <laughs> phone will be upside down and all that good stuff yeah he'll be like yeah matt, tell matt that i'm gonna go diving later this this month <laughs> you know absolutely Hey, uh, uh, Greg, we also now have a way for people to connect with us, too, so that if they have episodes that they want to hear about or maybe they want to comment on or maybe they have questions, suggestions, uh, and we're fine with hate mail, too, uh, we have an email address. Yeah, go ahead and plug that for us. Sure. The email address is internationalteacherpodcast at gmail.com. So you can hit us up with anything that you need and we will reply and we'll try to include it in the show, too. That sounds like the name of our podcast with just a Gmail at the end of it. You're that- not the best color commentary guy in the business for nothing, Greg. <laughs> I've been working hard. I really have. <laughs> been working on my craft. <laughs> so in today's show, Greg introduced me last time. So it's my turn to do the question asking and we're going to give our audience an opportunity to get to know Greg a little bit and where he, he comes from and his background. We'll go from there. Sound I've good? I've spent the last four days trying to think of a police, uh, some kind of a police story with you, Matt, and I haven't got one yet. <laughs> 
Well, I've got several. So I've got actually I've got a couple that uh, included you. I think. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure about that. I think you and I have kept out of trouble for the most part. You know, and, and Greg, sorry, this is a total side note, but do you remember? Um, sorry, listeners, for a quick story here. Um, Greg and I were diving in the Bahamas once. Um, we were in NASA, and you and I had gotten off the dive boat. We were diving with Stuart Coves. Those are the big uh, shark dive people in, Na- in outside NASA in the Bahamas. Anyway, uh, Greg and I didn't really bother changing out of our dive stuff. Do you remember that day? Oh, when we walked across that whole town in, in yeah. the in our uh, suits. <laughs> yeah. We might have to use that as our timestamp for this. It popped up. This was, that was actually 10 years ago to this day. It popped up on my Facebook feed this morning. Oh, those memory things, right? Yeah. And so there's a picture of Greg standing in the street wearing a skin body suit. And then I'm right next to him with a sweatshirt and a bright blaze orange fleet farm winter hat. And it's probably 85 degrees out. And, I thought uh, I had we, some kind of uh, camouflage on you in my mind. You weren't wearing camouflage. It was just uh, like a fleet farm, like a my, farm and fleet orange hat. Yeah, my bright orange fleet farm hat. So we might have to use that as our stamp. It's a good good memory and a good picture. But not many people in the Bahamas when it's 84 degrees and sunny see two people wandering around like that. But And they don't really know what a farm and fleet or fleet farm is. But, you know, we do. And that's part of what we do is we go overseas and we share our... Uh, I don't know, our home decor, our home colors, right? Yeah, spreading the message. That's spreading right. Spreading the message. That's right. Okay, so Greg, let's jump into this. So first of all, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, uh, but you were actually an international student. You want to talk about that first. You were an international student before you became an international teacher. Yeah, about 100 years ago. I think uh, that was back, let's see. 1986, 87. Well, I won't go into that much detail, but yeah, I just went overseas as a exchange student and I was probably one of five that went that year through the certain program. And my parents let me out of the, the house long enough to go live with another family. It reawakened the whole idea of travel for me because we had been stuck in the same city for, I don't know, eight, eight or 10 years, I think. Because before that, we were, you know, I was an army brat. We drove, we, we uh, went all over the states, and we went to Germany as as a child. And uh, anyway, I was my dad was in the army, so that really gave me that travel bug. And then went overseas for a whole year into Berlin. So you did your senior high school in Berlin? Yeah, much to the chagrin of my buddies that that all graduated without me. I came back and uh, graduated with some new buddies, though. So I redid my year because I just had too much fun that year. <laughs> So, well, I think that's kind of the point, actually. Uh, so let me get this straight. So you've lived as a kid overseas. Your dad was in the Army. You were an Army brat. Then you moved back to the U.S. for several years. And then you went back overseas again for high school for a year. You got that yeah, right? Yeah, that's about, that's about a nutshell right there. Okay. So do you think that had any role in you deciding, you know what, I also want to become an international teacher? Well, it did once I found out there were international teachers. I don't know about you. I had no clue this even happened. I had no idea what was going on. But once I found out about it, I jumped at the chance. Yeah, immediately. I had to. I had to go traveling and, you know, traveling and teaching, two things I want to do, just like you. Those are the two best things about this career, you know. Sure. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. So why don't you tell me about your experience teaching in the U.S.? Yeah, I didn't teach in the U.S. I I did some uh, student teaching. I remember teaching first grade, and my favorite little episode of that was I had student teach in a first grade in Appleton, Wisconsin, for just like two weeks, and I had to do a lesson. And my my supervisor from the my professor was coming from the school to watch. Remember those days where you do a student teaching, and the professor yes. comes in and watches your final culminating activity. I had made these maps out on a printer with all the kids' names. And we were doing, is it farther to get from home to the post office or is it home to school? And how do you measure that? Because we don't, you know, it's not like as the crow flies. So guess what happened, Matt? I had to come up with some kind of a, you know, measurement tool. And I figured, what do I have around my college apartment? I had a bunch of change sitting around. So I took all the pennies out of my change drawer. And I figured, I'm just going to give each kid a pile of pennies and 
they can use a penny and say it's five pennies to the post office and five pennies to the, you know, and they would really enjoy the maps and everything. What a ridiculous thing to do with kids, first graders. They ended up throwing the pennies, Matt, everywhere. The kids are just chucking pennies at each other, beating each other in the forehead. I tried to get them to control and that, that didn't work. I mean, I'd never been in a classroom before. It was my student teaching first round. And the teacher stands up and she tries to stop all the kids and gets beamed by a penny from one of them. And then sure. my supervisor who was sitting in the corner, she stood up and tried to get the class to calm down. The principal, I, I mean, I can embellish this even more. I think the superintendent, you know, maybe popped their head in too. <laughs> but I didn't do any teaching in the States, Matt. I just did all of my learning in the States. Sure, sure. So did you have a career prior to becoming an educator, actually? Or did you just go to college, become an educator, and then, oh. We don't have to go into it too much. I was a, okay. I was a manager for a Warner Brothers Studio Stores. They used to have these stores for Bugs Bunny, just like they did the Disney stores. So I worked in malls for four or five years, Matt. And then I went back sure. to school for education. So, yeah, I had a whole career before I had. But the best thing that I got out of the career was that I love teaching people how to do things. And knowledge is sort of wasted unless I share it. The best thing about that whole career was realizing I just want to be a teacher. Sure. So would you say then all that work you did prior to that, how did you decide teaching is the field for me? I'm going back to school. Rodney Dangerfield style. Yeah, <laughs> that was awesome to be back in school for four years as, a, as an adult. Uh, actually, I was more serious about learning how to teach and I wanted to do it really well. So I went back for another four years. I don't. I just knew I wanted to be a teacher. It was inherent. My mom was a teacher. My grandparents were both teachers. My grandfather was a principal. So I had a lot in the family. I just just sort of knew it right away. Bam, got to sure. teach. But I had no idea where, though. All these years I've known you, I had no idea your mom was a teacher. I did not know that. I think she. Uh, I don't think she ever taught like a full year. I think she did all the college preparatory. She did all the preparatory stuff, and then she ended up uh, going to work so that my dad could go through dental school. So she supported okay. the family and paid for some, you know, things while he was off working as a dentist. So, right. Yeah. She, had, she, she didn't end up teaching at all. Smart woman. She got yeah, a taste. No kidding. <laughs> she dodged she the bullet out. there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Whew, dodged the bullet there. Okay. So having a career prior to education and then going back into school and becoming an educator, how did you find out about international education in the first place? Where did, where, how did your path end up there? Oh, that's a funny, st that's my, one of my favorite stories. I'm glad you asked that. It, it, I didn't hear about it from anybody. I thought it was just like teaching in, in Africa, you know, teaching in the sticks or something. I went to a party right around the December 2000. I was at a Christmas party in between. You know, after all of the school stuff, we had Christmas break and I went to a party, had a few drinks and I stood next to this guy. I don't know who it was. And he said, oh, you want to teach? You want to be a teacher and you love to travel? Well, you should go to Iowa. <laughs> I said, <laughs> Iowa? <laughs> all roads lead to Iowa. <laughs> yeah. You want to eat corn? I mean, seriously, I, I said, what I said to the guy, what are you talking about? And he said, I don't know. There's some kind of a school down there that does some kind of a a headhunter thing for international schools. And I said, what? He said, yeah, I think it's Northern Iowa or something. So I ended up Googling it. Next thing I know, a, a month later, I was at a job fair. That was intense. Very intense. So you were also the University of Northern Iowa job fair. Yeah. They're getting a lot of, a, a lot of positive press out of this. So when you went to your first job fair, where'd you end up going? Nobody wanted me, really. <laughs> I ended up meeting Debbie and she was the principal in Honduras at a school. And I, I was like, okay, I'll, maybe I'll sign up for that. And I, I didn't really have any choices. I had one other school that wanted me and I can't remember which one that was. Got flat out denied from like five others, even interviewing with them. Debbie wanted me down in, in Honduras for fifth grade. And I ended up going down that July, actually. Sure. But I didn't even have a teaching degree. I didn't have my certification. I didn't have my degree. I didn't have anything. I was I was missing out on a week of student teaching just to get ready for the job fair. Sure. So I went down to Honduras. It was uh, it was really really a cool experience. So let me see if I got this right. You were doing so there was a, some slight overlap between your job search and your actual student teaching. Did I get that right? Yeah, because it it wasn't even a. I didn't even realize I was job searching. I mean, we had. Uh, 
the second week of student teaching. And then I went away with one of my classes. We went to St. Louis to do a TESOL conference. So teachers of speakers of other languages. Sure. And we did a conference uh, presentation as a class down there. And then I jumped on a plane right after that on like Thursday night to Iowa somehow for that weekend. So I missed an entire week of student teaching. And that was my sure. third week of student teaching. It was a third grade or something like that. I ended up at a job fair. And I didn't even know what I was looking for. So, you know, we'll talk, you know, like I said, we'll talk about job fairs later, but I had no clue what was going on and it overlapped completely with my student teaching. Okay. So then you basically finished out the school year, you got your certification and then you took off and went for a life overseas. Oh man, that was crazy. Wasn't it? Oh, it was yeah. absolutely nuts. Yeah. You weren't there, but I, it was definitely the craziest six months. Finishing up school was easy because I didn't have to look for a job. Because I went sure. home with a job in February. I think it was the first week of February was that job fair. And I went back with a job hired as a fifth grade teacher. It just so happened to be in another country. Sure. So for the rest of the school year, I could just do all my studies and get great grades and graduate and work a little bit and then go down to Honduras. Excellent. So Honduras was your first international stop. Where else have you been in your international career? Good question, Matt. You're a great host. I went from Honduras for three years. I went to Egypt for one. I went to Kuwait for two after that. I went to Cambodia for two years after Kuwait. From Cambodia, I went to Venezuela with you guys, and I was there yeah. for four. Sure. And then you went to the Middle East, and I went up to Switzerland for three years. And then I landed in the Middle East, and I've been here since 2016. So it's seven different countries and seven different international schools. It's been quite a ride. Yeah, uh, that's impressive. I already lost track of all the years trying to add those up in my head. From all the different job positions and things like that that you've had internationally, what's been the one that you really liked the most? Like, oh, I loved doing that. Ah, oh, man, there's. I loved being a homeroom teacher, but... I think it really broadened because every t every position I was in, I was using technology. So I think Venezuela was probably my favorite of the jobs because not only just the school and the lifestyle and everything, but the job itself was just everything technology. While you were sure. in the you you and Stacy were in the homeroom, and I was trying to support you guys as well as doing three or four different things at the same time and teaching tech to all the kids. All the grade levels, I got to teach, you know, three-year-olds how to use a mouse, video editing with 10th graders and everything in between there. So not only did I teach and I did all the, the tech director type stuff too, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And I got to give you props too for the job that you did with that because, I mean, you had us doing stuff in our classrooms in Venezuela, you know, over half a decade ago that are just starting to kind of surface now that classrooms are doing. So like, for example, when this whole transition to doing the Zoom meets or Google meets and things like that for, co we'll call it COVID education. I mean, we had been doing that several years ago. Like this was when we found out this was going to happen. I was like, oh, Greg had us doing this years ago. This is nothing. Yeah, so I'm glad we were using Google back then because we had introduced it at that school and got away from the archaic email they were using. But it was a good job because we could introduce and share a lot of things with students and with staff. And I love that part of the job, which I'm doing currently also at this school. But is that your school well, bell? <laughs> that's our school bell. Um, this is uh, not during school hours, by the way. The bells are just not working properly. Right. <laughs> so uh, maybe we can. Yes. All right. We're, we're going to move things along then. So sure. With all the international teaching that you've done, surely you've done a lot of travel and things like that. What would you say have been some of the cooler places you've been able to check out in your journey? Oh, where do I start with that? You've been on a lot of with me in the later years. I'd say one of the first things that comes to mind is is my trip to to Tanzania and or Tanzania, whatever you want to call it. Depends on where you're from. We went to we flew into Nairobi and then we went down for an African safari for six days. That was fantastic. Unless you've ever, you need to do a 
safari. I never thought I would, but it was like the old Merlin Perkins, right? The old, uh, what was the name of that show, Matt? Mutual of Omaha's Wild, Wild Kingdom. Kingdom. That's right. Yes. I was on my <laughs> own Wild Kingdom. It was fantastic. And uh, I just, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I've to this day, and that was back in 2004 or 2005 that I went on that trip. It was just four days, five, no, six days that we were on traveling out on safari. And uh, that changed my whole life. When you see animals out there still, it's it's hard. I mean, I could go on forever about it. I think seeing crocodiles and seeing hyenas and seeing lions. And the one thing I'll share with you, there's we're driving along and the the guys come over the radio, the other the other trucks come on the radio. And when they spot a uh, a lion pride that's taken down some, you know, wildebeest or something like that, and they're feeding, they will radio in and all the other trucks that are in the area will zoom over and try and get to that point to show all of the people in their truck. And sure. we, yeah, we ended up, he's, he's like, wait till you see this. And we pull up and there's about two other trucks there. And we, I am just spitting di- distance away from a lion pride that's feeding on a wildebeest. And as we're watching, I mean, the, the flies were amazing. The vultures are, are like hopping around in the outside of the trucks. All of a sudden you look up and down from the hill comes this alpha male, the alpha male of the lion pride. Just like in The Lion King, you know, he just saunters down and he tackles one of the females and he t- and all the others scatter away and watch him take his lion's share. Brutal, but right in your face watching that. So that was probably my top trip as far as, like, I can't believe I'm here. Or maybe traveling through the bamboo jungles in Cambodia. I felt like I was in the heart of darkness, right? Sure. Angkor Wat, is that in Cambodia? Angkor Wat is in Cambodia. I used to, when people came to visit me from other schools or, or friends that I had met overseas that came to visit me in Cambodia, I would take them on like the death tour. We'd go to the high school, which was part of the genocide back in the 80s, and it's a, it's a tour destination right now. We'd go to the high school first, and then in the same city, we'd go to see the, the killing fields, the actual killing fields the, ba- the movie's based on. And at the end of the evening, we'd go out for dinner and I'd show them the movie, which is just brutal. And we'd talk about it. It was because I was right there. Sure. So that was that was tough. But I love Cambodia, man. Loved it. Never. I've never actually seen The Killing Fields. That sounds like something I need to check out. Yeah, I might have to watch. I don't know if I want to watch it with you. I've watched it so many times and it's it's a heart wrenching uh, real. It's, sure. You know, it's right up there with Hotel Rwanda and. Schindler's lists and uh, you know, some of the any movie that has something to do with genocide it's just it's terrible but you have to see it once yeah okay so those are some of my favorite trips you know I'll check it out and then we'll talk about it when I'm done with it that sounds good okay so we talked about some places that you really liked to go uh, what's a place still on your list that's unchecked you still oh, have to check it out I haven't seen the China wall yet have you seen that yet uh, I saw it on Google from outer space, actually. Right. I, I've seen it. I mean, I've seen it, you know, in magazines and stuff. You know, there's some people that I have a buddy that always says, yeah, well, I can I have, I can get it on uh, National Geographic, but I want to go see these places. So I think the China Wall is one of them. There's also a train that goes across mainland China for like 10 days. And I want to get on. I can't remember the name of it, but I do want to get onto that train and take that trip across the country, too. I think those are two things in China I want to do. My bucket list. Oh, I keep checking things off. We talked about that before, and my bucket list keeps getting smaller, and I have to think of new things to do. Good problem to have. I love that. That's one of the things about international teaching, and we'll talk about that in maybe the next episode of travel. But, boy, there's your bucket list, is it fills up. As, we, as you keep adjusting it, it keeps filling up. You have to readjust it every year almost. Sure. I can't think of, let's, off the top of my head, I can't think of another top 10. They're mostly dive destinations because like you, I'm a big diver. So going to Indonesia, I want to go to Rajampat and I want to do a lot of diving. I've never been, believe it or not, Matt, I've seen more of, of the world than I have of our country in the U.S. So some of my top destinations now, as I get older and I've lived overseas more, a lot of my bucket list happens to be in the States. 
And I haven't yeah. seen Mount Rushmore. I don't remember that. I haven't been out west. There's quite a few places in the States. I've never been to Hawaii, man. Yeah, neither have I. Macadamia nuts and coffee and, you know, it's the great diving that's there. And, oh, I got to go. So Hawaii is on my list. I'll share that with you. You know, in Hawaii, obviously gets a ton of positive press, but everybody I know that has gone diving in Hawaii was not impressed. Really? Yeah, yeah. So well, that's, I still want to see it for myself. You know, oh, I want yeah. to, you can go with me. We'll go check I've, out some I wall fully dives. intend on checking Hawaii out, absolutely. But uh, everybody that I've talked to that's a diver was like, eh, not so much because it gets built up. Like the Maldives, you fall out of your boat and you're like, whoa, this is amazing. Or, you know, Galapagos, you fall out of your boat and it's you're part of a nature show. And they right. said when they got to Hawaii, they were expecting the same thing and that wasn't the case at all. Well, you and I have a really high bar to set that we've set for ourselves with diving. It's difficult to say. I'd like to see Hawaii just as it is, just besides the diving. Of course, diving is number one for me, but I want to see some sure. of the mountains and I want to see there. I want to get laid and all that. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, with the lay no, exactly around your neck. You yeah. What else would you mean, Greg? Exactly. <laughs> Obviously, last episode, I was talking about the need to reconnect and to kind of reestablish who you are, ground yourself, yada, 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 whatever. When you go back to um, that state, we dare not say its name because the god-awful football team also gets included every time you go back there. Oh, you mean uh, Wisconsin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the Green Bay Packers, for those of you that aren't list, that weren't for sure. Um, Greg is a big Packer fan. We try not to let that interfere with our friendship. What do you do every time you go home? Like, what's a place you go or what are some people you see how do you reconnect with old Greg? I think the the most important thing and is to see family. You know, I I'm close with my family, so I need to go and see my two brothers and my parents are number one. Even if they don't feel that way, that's still part of it. You know, a big part of what I do when I go home is to see family for sure. I don't really have a home because my parents have moved so much and they've done so many different kinds of homes. I think it's turned into my little brother's house now. Anytime I walk into their house, I feel immediately at home. In German, they say gemütlich, which there's no English word for that. It's like a phrase of feeling right at home when you walk in. What was that phrase again? Gemütlich? That's it. You got a great oh. job, buddy. Krankenwagen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, a little shout out to your son there. Krankenwagen. That's right. Yes, uh... So anyway, that when I go home, I have to reconnect by, by seeing them and going to their homes and staying with them. And I've spent a lot more time with my younger brother and his family than uh, Jeff, my older brother, and his family. But that it doesn't matter because when I go back, it's all about quality of the time, not the time I'm back. I mean, yeah. I have to have one day with each brother and their family, and I'm good. Right. I think you do a pretty solid job of seeing friends of yours, too, also. Well, yeah, I was going to get to that next because the other part is I need to go out in the woods once in a while. I need to be on a lake fishing. I go. I love going back to your place where your family is in, in northern, northern Wisconsin, even though you don't like to say it. But you transplants that have come over to the east a little bit over that river, you have a beautiful spot to go and fish. And I just sure. love listening to Buffett and sitting in your boat. I think some other things I have, I have some core friends that I have to see every time I go home too. And just spending time at my buddy's uh, cabbage, I guess you can call it. My buddy Joe and his family have a, have a cabin. I like to do that just for a weekend or as long as I can. And then I have a buddy Mike. I usually go to his house and drink a whole lot of uh, beverages and enjoy talking about hunting and stuff, right? <laughs> yes, I just your rental car story popped into my head. So oh, we'll save that. Yeah, that rental car story <laughs> probably doesn't need to be told for another 10 years or so. Yeah, that, well, but, sorry, uh, everybody. We might skip that story. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so the other thing is to just go and sit for just as long as I can and just sit with my buddy Cappy and, you know, usually I like to see him at a at a Buffett concert. So if I can see Cappy and, and his family and see Paul and Cherie at a Buffett concert, that caps my whole summer, you know. 
And for those of you listening, if you don't know what he means by Buffett, obviously Jimmy Buffett. So Greg's a huge parrothead as well. (laughs) Huge parrothead. And for if you're Greg's family and friends listening to, uh, you know, we know just as much about you as our own family and friends because Greg talks about all you guys all the time. So Pat, if you're listening to this, Greg uh, always gives us family updates. So even though he may not talk to you on the phone that often, uh, we always know what's going on with you guys. So, well, Matt, my defense, go. remember I said it's all about quality, not quantity. I'm getting better at my yep. communications, but if I see you, one of my friends or my family for just a few moments even, I think I drove down to Milwaukee this Christmas just to say hi to my dad for no longer than I want to say I was with him for two hours. Sure. And it was great. I mean, just seeing yeah. my father for two hours was enough to get me through, you know, to the next six months or next year or whatever. And that's sure. like, like you, I have to go back every, you know, that time is closed up. I used to spend three years away from, from the United States and go travel. But now I have to go home in the summertime or, you know, close to a year if possible. Give or All take right. a pandemic or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let's. Yeah, don't, let's not even start on that. I won't. So when you are overseas, uh, what's something you miss most? Something you miss the most about being away? Cheese curds. <laughs> 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 well, if I'm in the Middle East, I have to say beer and bacon, and I can't just, you know, gloss over that. I'm in a place where I just can't get that. But those are the two things I miss the most as far as uh, missing home. Uh as long as I have a rule, and that's if I'm overseas, I have to have ice. I have to be mobile, so I have to have a car or a scooter or something, and I have to have a maid. And those sure. are the three things that will keep me in any country. If I can do that, I can live under a bridge, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't miss a whole lot of things, Matt, to tell you the truth. I've been okay. away for so long, I, I, I can't even go back to the States for two weeks without thinking I need to move on. You know, rambling guy. So I tell you what, then this question is a little bit, well, it's, I guess, sort of the opposite of that one then. So when you live overseas, it's, there's kind of a duality to it or almost a paradoxical nature of sorts. So you do miss a couple things when you're at home, but then once you're home doing those things, having your beer and bacon and cheese curds and whatnot, suddenly you realize, well, I miss this now about living overseas. So once you're back home again, what gets your mind back toward overseas living? What do you tend to miss then? It's the travel. I, I would think it's probably the same for you. I, I When you're in the States, you don't travel that much outside of like, you can go state to state to state and there's a ton of things to see, but going from language to language to, to culture to culture, and it's, I'm not talking about being in Miami and hearing Spanish or being in <laughs> Wisconsin yeah. or Minnesota and hearing different kinds of languages. I'm talking about the culture and the language together. So those things together, that that's what I miss because yeah. the colors of the people, you know, is as metropolitan as you can get, unless you go to New York, Washington, DC and New York are, that's the kind of feeling that you and I have all the time. That's what I miss when I'm in green Bay, because in green Bay, it's very white. It's very Catholic, right? Sure. There's some things that change. There's there's different colors of people now, and it's changed over the years. But it's nowhere like I feel when I'm traveling, and I'm the odd man out. I've been on airplanes where I'm the only white person. I've been in countries where I'm the only white person outside of my, you know, in, in within a hundred miles. That's crazy. Yeah. So, I guess that's that's that feeling. I don't really know how to describe it. Sure, and that's so hard. And and what you talked about at home, too, with, you know, the demographics and, and things like that, that's that's home and that will always be home. And there's we're not saying there's anything wrong with that at all. But there's also until you've looked around and you're the only white person in the room, it's an incredibly different feeling. But it's when you get used to that and you start to not even notice it anymore. There's a there's an element of freedom that comes with that until you until it hits you and you experience it. You're like, oh, wow. Like, do you remember being kind of weirded out? Like you'd look around and be like, wow, I'm the only pale face in this joint. I still am. I'm still am. I'm still odd man out many times. It's that, that weird feeling, but it's sort of comforting because I'm used to it now. Yeah. 
I mean, don't get me wrong. I love going home and being with other people that look like me, that speak my language, that speak Ched, that's, you know, Wisconsin. But it's so strange. I like both. You know, I, yeah. I think I'm more accustomed to being odd man out. And I tell you what, Matt, it's not just about color either. It's about language. I told you I lived in Switzerland for three years. And I remember sitting at a party in Zurich. And I was speaking German with the hostess, my friend. I looked around and I felt like such an oddball because everybody was speaking a different kind of German that I didn't understand. They're speaking a high Swiss German. Sure. I didn't understand a thing. And she raised her hand. She goes, okay, everybody, I need you to switch over to German now. She said it in English. I need you to switch over to high German now so that Greg can understand you. The eight other people in the in the room started speaking high German Within two minutes, they had all gone back into their own language or French or German, you know, whatever Swiss that sure. they were speaking. It was crazy. And, yeah. and I know you've had a lot of experience with languages, too. I looked around the room and I was like, man, I, you know, it looks like um, somewhere else. But, man, I'm not here. I'm not here. I'm the odd man out in language and culture. Would you agree that when you're overseas and you are around all these different people, that it, people find even though we're different, if you just make that effort to maybe identify with them uh, at their level or with whatever they have going on, people are typically incredibly kind, incredibly gracious and forgiving of the fact that, like, for example, there's some gringo here trying to mutter something in Spanish to get something. But people always tend to be very forgiving and, and gracious when they see you making an effort. And that's so important, I think. What do you, what do you think of that? Well, I totally agree with you on that one. You and I both, even if you learn how to say thank you in their language, you know, and you need to learn how to say things in the language that the host country you're in, because if you get in a taxi cab and you can at least say thank you in their language, yeah, they'll, they'll love it. They really, they open up immediately, yeah. especially if you're trying their language. And you bring in even more colorful moments when you attempt the slang and even maybe even a cuss word or two. And that really wins you some friends when people hear that. So. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll get into that later. Uh, so, Greg, maybe a harder question. I know uh, you're more of a fly by the seat of your pants kind of a guy. What, what are you going to be doing in five years? Oh, I've got like 15 different plans. That's for sure. I think I'm still going to be here. That's my plan A is still to be at, at this sure. school and, and work here. Otherwise, I could be anywhere in the world. I will not be back at home. It's just not in the cards. It's not my flavor. I think if anything, I might retire there, but. Absolutely. Difficult question to answer for five, five years. For an international teacher to know what you're doing in the next five years is absolutely. You have to have, you don't have a crystal ball like that. We move around so much in general, I'd say. Gypsies in the palace, that's for sure. We are gypsies in the palace. Uh, I've got one more one more question for you. Uh, well, one more and then just a basic one. Um, so I'll start with the basic one first. What else do you think people need to know about you that I haven't brought out in this interview yet? What else do we need to talk about? I could talk for hours. I don't know, Matt. That's a tough question. Fly by the seat of my pants. I guess I just can't think of doing anything else in this world than being overseas teaching sure. children. Yeah. That's about me in a nutshell. And I don't know. I, I really miss the Mani Japonesa, the little peanuts from <laughs> and the blue bottles from Venezuela so much right now. That's true. That's true. Well, the dry country does that to you. This is your last question. We're going to test. I got this it. This is one of the things I love about traveling with you because anybody that knows you knows that you could talk to a brick wall and you could talk the brick wall into going out to dinner with you. And so I love to travel with you because you take care of the talking and I can just kind of sit there because I find idle chit chat to be kind of exhausting sometimes, but you're a pro at it. In all your international travels, what's been the coolest or most random conversation that you've gotten into with somebody? where you were just like, man, that was a cool conversation. Like, I can't believe that just happened. Well, I got this one. I got this one. I got two examples for you. And Go for it. The first one, I'm in Iowa again. This is my third job fair, I think, in Iowa. And I was coming from, I had flown in from Cambodia. And I was looking for my next school. 
and I'm sitting in the elevator in the middle of Iowa, smack dab in the middle, not quite Kansas, but in the middle of the United States. And you know what a wasteland that is in the wintertime, right? And I'm uh, sitting, yep. yep, I'm sitting in the elevator. And granted, we're we're in a situation of international teachers. It's a recruiting fair, but the guy behind me in the elevator said, "Here's me talking about Cambodia," because I have a relatively loud voice, especially in an elevator. And the guy, the guy goes, "Hey, I I hear you talking to talk about Cambodia. Do you know Dave?" <laughs> and I said, "Dave, yeah, I know Dave and his wife." She goes, "Yeah, we talked with him in Pakistan." <laughs> Say hi to him for me. So here I am in an, in Iowa talking about Pakistan and Cambodia with some people I've never met before. Sure. Twenty four hours later, after a long flight, I'm talking to Dave and his wife about their friends. I forgot their names. I'm so sorry. Their friends that I met in Iowa that they had taught with in Pakistan. So strange. I mean, it, you couldn't. I mean, I, I wouldn't have been more surprised if I'd woken up with my my lips stapled to the carpet. You know. Seriously. Sure. Well, it's amazing how the world shrinks. You go away for a couple of years and all of a sudden everybody becomes uh, separated, you know, one degree and that's it. It's no longer the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. It's the, do you know, do you know the so-and-sos that uh, were there? When I went on safari back in 2004, there were four of us on this trip in one Jeep and the rest of the 30 people were in different Jeeps. So the four of us that were in the Jeep, one was my buddy Mooney. He's in Russia right now. The other two that were in the Jeep were a married couple teaching in Alexandria. And this is 2004, Alexandria, Egypt. So I was teaching in Cairo and they were in Alexandria, Egypt. So we all ended up in the same Jeep together with our guide and our driver. And we spent six days hanging out together, and then we said goodbye. And I didn't really hear from them. You know, we had Facebook maybe, but that was about it. Now, 2016, I go to a meeting at my current school. I go to a meeting, and who's sitting on the lawn right there at lunchtime? But the same damn couple that I had been in a Jeep with in 2004. I couldn't believe it. And the the conversation, it was more of the situation than it was the conversation because all it was was a big hug from both of them. That was the conversation. Like, hey, how you doing? Oh, my God, good to see you. And we're all in the same place. Great conversations after that, though. And it's been a a small world. So those are my two favorite conversations. Good question. question. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. So as we wrap up, uh, we've gotten to hear a little bit about Greg and his background as a as a child, as an army brat, then going back to the States, then back to the Germany for high school, and then back from Germany to the U.S., going through college, having a career, deciding he wanted to become an educator, then making the jump from it and being a student teacher to working into Honduras, and then on to Cambodia, and then on to Switzerland, and then on to Egypt, and then on to Venezuela, North Ar- on uh, and on it, and on. Yeah, 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 the Antarctic, the North Pole, the guy's been everywhere. Greg, thanks for taking some time to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you are all about. We want to remind everybody, you know, if you have any comments, if you have questions, uh, maybe you have future topics that you want to hear us hit on. Remember, we now have email. You can write us at internationalteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Greg, are we going to jump on any other uh, media platforms too? Do we need a Twitter account? Do we need to tweet or do we need an IG account? What are your thoughts about that? Let's hear from our audience at some point. If we need to, we'll jump on there too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've always been told I have a face for radio. So let's maybe do an IG account at least. You have two faces for radio, Matt. Two. (laughs) All right. Well, Uh, I'm going to check us out of here for the day. Thank you for everybody who's listening. Remember, we uh, just heard from Greg, the single guy. And this is Matt, or expat Matt, the family guy. And this is the International Teacher Podcast. We are signing off, everybody. Have a great day.